I'm going to start with a former colleague of mine from the Chicago Urban League, Darius Hillman. Darius Hillman is the executive director of the Chicago State Foundation. There he has led accountability for advancing the interests and welfare of Chicago State University through partnership development, stewardship of university assets, and identification and solicitation of financial support from individuals, corporations, and foundations. Most recently, Darius was the chief executive, chief of, of external affairs at Chicago International Charter School. Previously, he was the executive vice president and chief operating officer of the Chicago Urban League. Prior to rejoining the Urban League, he was the executive director of Affirmations Community Center in Detroit, providing leadership and strategic vision for one of the 10 largest LGBTQ plus community centers in the nation. And before that, he was Chief Development and Marketing Officer for Youth Guidance in Chicago, where he oversaw fund development activities, as well as the agency's marketing and communication initiatives. Darius is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Welcome, Darius. Come on in the room. <laughs> Next, uh, my friend, Mark Ishag. Mark has dedicated his career to advocating for the rights of stigmatized and vulnerable people. As the CEO of Thresholds, Mark has overseen expansive growth, but also a culture shift that embraces change, innovation, transparency, and yes, love. Mark serves on the board of the National Council for Behavioral Health, Kennedy Forum, Illinois, Illinois Association for Behavioral Health, and the Civic Federation of Chicago, as well as on the membership committee of the Economic Club of Chicago and the Leadership Fellows Association Board of Leadership Greater Chicago. Prior to Thresholds, Mark worked as a leader in the fight against HIV AIDS as CEO of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Mark holds a master's degree in political science from Northwestern University, go cats, and a bachelor's degree in government and international studies from University of Notre Dame. Welcome, Mark. Next, one of UCAN's own, Leslie Mendoza. She is, L is an LC LCPC, is a clinical supervisor with counseling and youth development services at UCAN. Leslie has worked as a child and family therapist for more than a decade, utilizing trauma-informed practice when working with historically marginalized populations. Leslie is a child parent psychotherapist working with minors and parents to repair, helping them repair wounds caused by significant trauma. She is also a co-facilitator of Quest, QUEST, which is a youth-led group exploring the intersectionality of multiple identities. Leslie is a member of a group of private practice, a private practice group where her clinical work focuses on providing counseling services to families that have no access to mental health services on the far south side of Chicago. Welcome, Leslie. Next, uh, my friend, my good friend, John Peller. He is the current CEO, President and CEO of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, where he oversees the over 130 person staff and nearly $33 million budget. John started at AFC in 2005 as, AF, as, their, as their state lobbyist, served as vice president of policy, and was named CEO in 2014 following the departure of David Ernesto Munar. Most recently, John has co-led with partners at the Chicago and Illinois Health Department's efforts to launch the Getting to Zero Illinois Plan, which will end the HIV epidemic in Illinois by 2030. He has a bachelor's degree from the Johns, Johns Hopkins University and a master's in public policy from the University of Chicago. John lives in Chicago with his partner, David, and rescue dog, Penny. And last, but certainly not least, speaking of sisters, I mentioned my blood sister, who's also who's tuning in from Houston, but we've got a Baton Rouge sister on, the, on, the, on this line as well, on this call. Shannon Lynn Parker is a human rights advocate, public speaker, community-centric leader, and director of strategic partnerships for Howard Brown Health, and serves on the board at Equality Illinois. Prior to her role at Howard Brown, at her current role, Shannon served as manager of the Broadway Youth Center's Youth Development Program, and manager of Chicago House Social Chicago House Social Service Agency's Trans Life Project. Shannon is the first openly transgender woman to work in the Cook County Department of Corrections, working with populations in protective custody. She's an inaugural Trans 100 awardee in 2013. She's been a White House speaker. She's also been a national HIV AIDS strategy worker. And, Chicago, and she's also was a Chicago Women's March speaker in both 2017 and 2018. Shannon is also the recipient of the Henrietta Lacks Award, Women in Health Chicago, and the Equality Illinois Prestigious Humanitarian Freedom Award in 2019. 
Last but not least, please welcome Shannon Parker and Shannon Lynn Parker and all of our panelists. All right, let's get into it. So um, I wanna begin with the quote from black feminist lesbian warrior, Audre Lorde. She once said, I have a duty to speak the truth as I see it and share not just my triumphs, not just the things that felt good, but the pain, the intense, often unmitigated pain. It is important to share how I know survival is survival and not just a walk through the rain. As we reflect on that quote from Audre Lorde, I'd like to ask our panel in alphabetical order as they were introduced to tell us how they are navigating the world as a member of or an ally to the LGBTQ plus community and where they stand at the intersection of racial equity and inclusion in the LGBTQ plus community. We'll start with Dara. First of all, thank you, Roderick. Thank you, you can for the invitation. And certainly as soon as you invited me to speak, my dog began to bark, so we'll work it out together. Um, you, here's the thing for me, and we'll have this conversation throughout the hour. I am a gay black man. I came out of the closet as gay. Um, when I came out of the wound, I was black. So similar experiences, but that, that blackness impacted every aspect of my life from the moment I came into the world, including the hospital where I came into the world because it impacted my forebearers before me. So as I walk into these spaces, um, as I'm turning around the sun toward 53, um, the increased agency that I insist on for myself impacts my work in those spaces in a way that perhaps it did not even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and we had this conversation. So, so for me, it is really, how can I be of service? I have been incredibly fortunate, um, but I have a lived a, a, a experience. So for me, the life of the intersection, that that space is the most interesting space for me. Um, and it is a space where I, I think I have a large amount of accountability to, to, to hold myself accountable, but to also, because I've done this long enough, for the generations coming behind me to go, um, one, I got your back in a true sort of supportive way and really hearing you because you have something of value to say um, and to not repeat past sins and mistakes, but to also at this point, because I have fewer Fs to give, to, to stand in the space and go, yeah, no, we've got to do better. Um, with all due respect, I, 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 I take issue with that. I don't feel comfortable in this room. Love is not being served. Um, and, and, and to, while I'm doing that, make sure that my spirit of discernment, so when someone is trying to lean in, those first few words may be inelegant, um, but spirit of discernment says to me, um, give him, her, or they a chance, um, ask for clarity, um, don't make your default position, because it's hard to do that when you are born into trauma, you're always fighting. Um, so, so part of my internal accountability is to go, take a breath, when, when he, she, or they just ask you that question, it may be for understanding, not for judgment or compartmentalizing you. So, so Roderick, that's kind of my overview of where I am in this space and, and what I feel my accountability is. Thank you, Darius. Next, we'll go to Mark. Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. So great to be with you and my friends and colleagues on this Zoom and the many out there. Uh, watching us. I'm so honored and privileged uh, to be with you today. And thank you for starting out with an Audre Lorde quote. I mean, what a way to kick off uh, uh, a conversation on the intersection of LGBTQ uh, rights and advocacy and, uh, and, our, and, uh, and the intersection with race. Uh, I love her. Uh, I use the word love a lot. So if you, you can always check me on that during this hour and a half conversation. But I also love that she said, your silence will not protect you. <laughs> I also love that she said, without community, there is no liberation. Uh, so I'm really excited about talking about uh, how we are uh, addressing pain, uh, including 400 years of structural pain in this country, um, and how we are working together to dismantle the caste system uh, that we were all born into, including me. I am from a place called Marquette Park, and if any of you are from Chicago, uh, Marquette Park historically will mean a lot to you. And for those that don't know what it means, it's probably a place in Chicago that 
I think Martin Luther King Jr. said was the scariest place he had ever been in his life. Most uh, racist outside of the, the South, more racist in the South. There you go. And he marched uh, through Marquette Park uh, and passed my house about 54 years ago. And I went back to my house and the park 54 uh, years ago uh, to commemorate that 50th anniversary of his march. Um, so I, yeah, you know, I'm sort of lucky as a very young child, uh, my mom was uh, leading uh, the fight against redlining, uh, which I hope we have even a chance to talk about because uh, such an important uh, part of us, what systemic uh, racism, structural racism. Um, and um, just really looking forward to um, learning and listening uh, from you all. Um, you know, I, I talked about the uh, pr protest um, and community. And as you all know, I started out my career here in Chicago 30 years ago uh, uh, in the fight against AIDS. Uh, and one of our mantras 30 years ago uh, was uh, silence is deadly. Uh, and I feel the same way today, even more so. Uh, that silence uh, on issues, especially around racial justice and systemic racism and structural inequity, that our silence, especially as privileged white men and LGBT men and women, uh, is deadly. And um, so I look forward to not being silent uh, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Leslie. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that thank you for everyone. It is an honor to be part of this uh, panel, and I look forward to hearing each of these, the stories and learn from everyone. Um, for me, it continues to be a journey of being told that I'm not enough. Um, I'm not Mexican enough because I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, I'm not American enough because I have Aztec blood run through my veins. I'm not queer enough because I have dated and fell in love with men in the past. And I'm not straight enough because I have dated and fell in love with women in the past as well. And when I do, I'm often objectified and hyper um, sexualized. And because I continue to hear that message to this day, I navigate those safe spaces with caution. Um, I can only speak about my experience, so I don't want for folks to think that my story represents the brown queer experience. But when I do go to the Pride Parade or market days in Boyce Town, do I see people who look like me in those spaces? Not really. So for me, representation is very important. And <clears throat> I work towards creating spaces for people with similar identities as mine. So I work towards exposing the youth that I work with um, by showing them and talking about the history, the media, the music and poetry created by brown and black queer folks. So they know that I see them and that there is a space for them in that community. Thank you, Leslie. And I, and I wanna say, at, no, actually I'm not gonna add anything right now because we're tight on time. Um, Shannon, you're up next. I cannot get two folks from Louisiana on a panel in a room, you, Roger brings out my accent. Um, so anyway, um, that, that, is, that is an amazingly thoughtful question. Um, and you all have, I, I take pieces of what everybody has said so far. Um, Mark, I, I too love the quote by Audre Lorde about how silences will not protect us, but it's interesting how speaking out um, is such a privileged thing that we are oftentimes not aware of. And that for so long, black bodies have lost their lives due to speaking out. And when you couple that, when you couple race with the intersections of identity, your speaking out becomes even more tenuous, right? It becomes even more frightening. Um, so one of the things that I will say is that um, my life has centered around um, for as long as I can remember. And although it is not the survival um, that entails me having to put foot to the ground in terms of like participating in um, a commerce to make sure that I'm fed or um, clothed or housed or things like that, but it's been the survival of sustainability and stability 
you know, the fear of, well, if I speak out against this, if I'm not agreeable, if I do not smile or nod, what will happen to me? Um, am I safe to actually say that thing? Maybe I should just agree, even though I don't agree, but you know what, whatever. I want to be able to pay my mortgage and my rent. Um, so it's that type of thing that um, I myself have lived with. And it becomes so deeply entrenched into your psyche and your day-to-day -day actions that you begin to say to yourself, my God, what do I actually agree with? Um, so it's those things um, that we oftentimes aren't bold enough or brave enough to actually say um, for fear of, I guess, um, that being cast away, right? Um, a colleague of mine in an affinity group, one day we were all sharing space and I stumbled over the words to think of and I finally came up with the words and I said, survival guilt. I live with survival guilt quite often. And in our community, we have a tendency to identify survival guilt with individuals who um, somehow averted um, the HIV AIDS crisis or other things like that but I've shared spaces and worked in spaces with other trans women who have been incarcerated for things that I did as well. It's just that they got caught and I did, right? Um, I just happened to meet the right folks at the right time and said the right words and somehow got the right promotion while they did not. And sometimes those are hard spaces to be in, but they also remind me of the great privilege and the great charge that I have to do well by those things and by the community that I am from and I live in. Wow. Well, well said. Thank you, Shannon. All of you. Thank you. Um, that's sinking in in a deeper way that I was ready for. This is this is group, by the way, for our wonderful audience, this is kind of group therapy too. So it's all good. So drop your thoughts in the comments, respond if you need to. John, you're the you're, you're next up to answer that question first question you're right bring it up bring it up the rear here thank you roderick and thank you you can for inviting me today um my my partner said to me um oh uh, you're doing a webinar on uh lgbtq identity and and race wow well, they're really going to want to hear from you as the white cis guy um and so i think um i i i Think, thank you for thinking that I have something to say on this topic. Um, and um, I, I really come into this world and come into this conversation from a position where I'm trying to be an ally. Um, but I also know that I have to be invited to be an ally and approach allyship very, very carefully and that I have to build trust and just can't show up and say, I'm an ally and I'm here to help. Um, the last few weeks have, have marked, as we all know, the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And uh, then tomorrow actually is the 40th anniversary of the first time that AIDS was described in a publication. And you know, for so many of us, um, me at, at my age, HIV and AIDS have, have really been in my, my world um, forever. And I, I don't remember a time when there wasn't AIDS and HIV. But the two, uh, race and racism and HIV are deeply, deeply connected because Black and Latinx people are the groups that are most impacted by HIV. And that's because of racist systems. Um, and it's from education to healthcare to housing, the job market to policing, and, and we can go on. So really at the heart of my work today and AIDS Foundation Chicago's work today is dismantling racist systems um, and getting away from uh, that that world and working from the framework of racism as a public health crisis. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, each of you have had some fantastic, have, not had, had outstanding careers. You're all organizations or institutions that have large budgets and touch lots of people. And many of our viewers are in similar spaces as executives, administrators, administrators activists, and advocates. And uh, with all the actions being done, let's talk about what we, we talked about a year ago. So piggybacking on what you just said, uh, we know where we were a year ago. With all the actions and work being done on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, some real, some performative, and some bullshit, let's just call it what it is, 
What is your th what are your thoughts to anyone watching today about how to better serve the LGBTQ plus community through a DEI lens? I will just open the mic and you all just whoever wants to jump in can jump in. I felt like they just did like a, a, a drop. <laughs> yeah, right, Shannon. Yeah, yeah. You know, Shannon, you want to take this and then I'll follow up. How do you want to go? Um, I, I will. I will. I will make mine as um, as brief as possible. So, for me, a couple of things, right? But I would start here, and I think before executing um, these lofty. DEI goals, we have to first ensure that the spaces that we work in have the infrastructure to support that envisioning by building out a solid framework that will set the direction and create alignment um, to generate commitment on a whole. I think that's the first thing, right? Um, I would also kind of jump in and um, y'all, like I always say, don't ask me to repeat this stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I would probably say that there needs to be maybe like two assessments, right? Um, one being that um, what is your continued, what is leadership's continued commitment to leadership development, okay? And I'm not talking about like, you know, the consultant that comes in um, and does the cohort. Those things are useful. I've benefited from them, um, but as you are able to shift position, be prepared to be a bit hands-on, right? Take, take inventory of everyone's um, learning style. I think that there is an over-reliance on external entities to come in and do the work that we ourselves um, need to be doing. I think this is really important when we're talking about working with or promoting within, um, particularly from the rank and file staff, right? That's really important. Um, the last thing I'll say before I pass it on over is um, while we focus, while the focus on diversity really, really is highly, highly necessary without equity, those efforts to even promote diversity and inclusion are not sustainable. Um, if there's nothing in place for individuals to attain their full potential, and if that roadmap for full potential unto itself is not diverse, as I said at the top of this answer. All, if it doesn't include all of the experiences, well, I should say consider all the experiences, the learning styles, the needs, will never achieve the fullness of what we're looking for, you know? So again, like I said, don't ask me to repeat that. Um, but those, those, are the, those are the two, two and a half things that I see. Thanks, Shannon. I would jump onto what Shannon said and just add, you know, I've, I've said in these conversations and, and the first thing I, I say to us as we're doing this work, um, we, it took 400 plus years for us to find ourselves here. So before we even begin, know that we will be in recovery for the remainder of our days. So we will be recovering. There, there's a recovery in anti-blackness. There's a recovering spirit. And that means that you, there's no finish line. Because I think people where DEI gets challenged, people go, all right, when do I know I'm done so I don't have to keep doing this? And we're good. Um, and that's not how muscles work. That's not how growth and learning works. The second thing I would say, I've seen this happen a lot. Best intentions, um, if you want to get from just having more Black and brown people and you want to get them to belonging and inclusion, then there has to be people who look like them, who have shared experiences at the table where decisions are being made. Because all the books in the world, all the great intentions, you do not know your blind spots if you don't know your blind spots. Um, and I find a lot of times I sit in rooms really, sometimes currently as a consultant, and I'll go, and I just asked a client this question recently. So in your leadership team who are deciding what your DEI process and measurements, because that which gets measured gets done. There is no one who can tell you, share with you blind spots. So the first thing there is to bring in folks um, to do that. The second thing is, is to know that you can add 50 black and brown employees, but if you are force feeding them into a culture that it has not changed or shifted to welcome them, they're simply going to leave and you'll be rinsing and repeating. 
And what you'll do six months from now is go, because I've seen this happen with hiring. Well, we tried um, and they just didn't work out. I mean, well, you didn't, you, you tried on the surface. You didn't create from top to bottom a space that is welcoming, um, that accepts their culture. Shannon, you said something the other day and it just, it just stuck with me, learning their language and being open to doing it, wanting to do it. So I think that's a, a lot of DEI is get ready to be messy, get ready to be uncomfortable, get ready to challenge your own thinking, get your teams ready to do that, and then get, get representation around that table when you are deciding what it looks like. Because we need to take the Hippocratic oath here and DEI work first, do no harm. Yeah, I, I love I love that what you both said, and I love that you brought up intention. Uh, you know, as a quasi Buddhist Taoist practitioner, intention is like one of the principles. And I always say intention is critical. Impact and outcome is everything. So the best of intentions that do not lead to and are not driven by a particular measurable outcome. Sorry, the intention just, I don't want to say it's meaningless, but it's never, ever enough, maybe necessary, but simply not sufficient. Um, our senior vice president of talent, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, a woman named Kim Maley has been with Thresholds for about 25 years. I've only been at Thresholds for nine years, so I'm a youngie sort of. I'm old, but in Thresholds terms, I'm young. Um, and she said, you know, as we were putting together our strategic plan last year that was in the works for a long time, these things take a long time to CEOs and folks out there doing planning know that this takes a long time. Uh, but she said something at a meeting uh, black woman, Kim Maley, um, DEI is in our DNA. And we, we all like, wow, it just sort of struck us. And I just felt so like privileged at that moment to think that I was part of an organization where a black leader said that DEI is in our DNA. So that actually makes it like an easier place to start, depending on where you are in the continuum of this hard work and it is work and it is hard and you have to commit to the work. Uh, you know, I'm really privileged to be leading an organization where people, uh, including Kim, feel that that's part of our DNA. But then taking it from being part of your DNA into actual work with the outcomes is sort of where the rubber meets the road, right? So when, you know, we just, uh, and I can share with all of you the strategic vision that we unveiled a couple of months ago. But what I love about it is that it's centered. It's not just centered in DEI but it's centered in what we wrote as one of the six pillars, number four pillar, which right in the center is to fight structural racism and create equity. To me, because that feels stronger than saying we're committed to DEI, but we are committed as an organization to fighting structural racism and creating equity. And, in, and, in, and then in our workforce development section, you know, we talk about commitment to DEI, racial justice, LGBTQ rights, and gender equity because I think this is all, uh, it's all connected and it all has to be included. Um, but, I, I, but I bring this up only to say that uh, we as leaders of organizations, uh, especially white led organizations, we have a responsibility to speak up and to speak out and to put our plans in writing and to make us accountable. Um, I put into, I mean, my contract at Thresholds has a DEI fighting structural racism component to it that if I don't meet that requirement, I'm in breach of contract. <laughs> uh, and my performance evaluation is based on developing and with the team meeting these metrics, so. Okay, and for the brief <laughs> responses from the next two folks if they'd like to jump in, I think I, we have to hear from Leslie and John, so. Yeah. Uh, I'll make mine very brief. Um, for me, it goes back to representation um, who are the leaders in these organizations and what are we doing to ensure that providers are members of the community that we serve? Can our white allies help us with their privilege make room or stand in the back or create a shield when their bodies, with their bodies, uh, when the oppressors, you know, are attacking us? So we need to figure out a way of how we can work together to make sure that uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color of the LGBTQ community, emphasis on the TQ plus, feel safe enough to say that this is my space. 
So for instance, at UCAN, I run my group uh, quests, which is an identity-based um, youth-led group where we work and focus on identity formation. And the curriculum includes conversations about the history of the Stone, uh, Stonewall riots. And we watch a lot of uh, videos about coming out, um, coming out experiences from um, BIPOC queer folks and hearing their stories from Afro-Latinos and Latino trans all found in platforms like Pero Like, uh, listening to youth. And again, I think key is listening to the youth tell me about their latest queer material. So for example, I hear a lot about uh, Little Nas X or appreciating the oldies from uh, Frank Ocean or Childish Gambino. Uh, and shout out to one of my coworkers, Deanna Pichelli, who um, does very, very valuable work in our programming has intentionally sought out to purchase stencils from local queer Black women artists in order for our youth can paint um, their canvases representing them and with their consent uh, be able to, to display their pieces in our residential unit for people to be able to appreciate and uh, support them. So my advice for people who are watching is to start listening to the youth and let them guide you create a safe space. And if possible, support local Chicago black and brown queer artists or businesses and advertise them in your agencies. I'll be very, uh, very quick here. Um, uh, Darius, I, I want to uh, build on a comment you made about being welcoming and making sure that the culture um, of the organization is welcoming and ready. Our, our board is now uh, 55 or 56 percent people of color. and. Um, our board chair, uh, Craig Johnson, uh, is an openly gay uh, Black person living with HIV and just love his leadership and working with Craig every day. We, we brought in a number of, of new board members this year, in, uh, or really in the last two years, who are uh, Black, many LGBTQ, um, our first uh, trans woman board member, uh, Black trans woman living with HIV. And we have to make sure they feel 100% welcome. Um, we have to make sure that our board is ready to welcome them with open arms. And um, that's something I've been spending, you know, of course here we all are all meeting virtually. It's, it's really tough. Um, we are very, very focused on um, welcoming folks so that they stay. And so their voices are heard um, and not just heard, but that they have opportunities to join board leadership um, uh, in the in the years ahead, because I hope they'll all be on for years to come. Thank you, John, and thank you for saying that. And I'll have a follow up for you and for Mark. Um, I'm jumping ahead. And thank you for acknowledging being in that you are here as cis white men who gay men who are leading those these large organizations that have a significant population, if not most of the people you serve are people of color. Um, John, I'm aware of thanks for sharing about your board makeup. In fact, I remember you reaching out to me some time ago about that. Mark, I'm curious just about the makeup of your board and your C-suite staff. The same, same for you, John, about the C-suite. I know we know about the board, but I want to know, I'm curious about the people of color, specifically in your C-suite staff and board. Yeah, so when I came to Thresholds nine years ago, there were there was one, and I think there was one person of color. Uh, and I uh, made a really concerted effort with my board uh, to to work on that. Um, and it's it was a it, it was a very hard, long road, and we have a long way to go. And I would give myself and ourselves uh, uh, a, a, a star or two for the hard work. Uh, but we are an incomplete for sure. Uh, I feel very fortunate that my board chair, uh, Suzette McKinney, uh, some of you may know uh, from the Illinois Medical District and uh, now it's Sterling Bay is the chair of the board. Uh, the secretary of the board is a black woman, Inger Burnett Ziegler at um, uh, Northwestern, a uh, psychologist. Uh, the vice chair is an uh, Indian man, uh, Dr. Ben Mothkor, the assistant secretary, uh, Scarlett Lever Ortiz, uh, a Mexican American woman uh, from CHA. So we've done a tremendous job in the last couple of years of really diversifying and going from 0% to 25% people of color including in most of the leadership positions in chairs and co-chairs and executive committee. Uh, 
So a lot of work to do there. Uh, the, the leadership team at Thresholds is diverse. The C-suite is not. Um, we have seven people in the C-suite and one uh, Egyptian American man uh, in the leadership team there. Uh, many senior vice presidents, several senior vice presidents of color and program directors and other vice presidents of color. Uh, but it's a, it's a shortcoming for us and something that uh, in our three year strategic plan have committed to addressing uh, because it's just, it's, it's not okay and we know it. Uh, I, I'll um, follow up on that. So uh, we have um, on our leadership team, we have nine people. Um, we have two amazing, amazing black women, uh, Cynthia Tucker and uh, Bashir at Olianju. Uh, and one Arab American woman, Nadine Israel. Um, again, we, we need to do better. Uh, and as we've had openings on our, our senior leadership team or, and thought about the composition, um, I've, we've been very deliberate about making sure we're adding uh, diverse voices. I think uh, we're, we're now working on a racial equity action plan uh, with Mary Morton and her team at the, at the Morton Group. Um, and so uh, hiring and leadership is going to be a focus of that plan when we move to implement it. Um, we quite simply need to do better. Um, the number of for example, black gay men working at AIDS Foundation, uh, the number of trans women, uh, black trans women is just not good enough. It's an area where I think frankly, um, we've failed. Uh, and so we need to look top to bottom at our hiring practices. Um, and the old answer of they're out there, but we can't find them is just not good enough. Absolutely. I want to thank you both for your honesty on that. And it's a good um, it's a reminder of an experience I had, as many, many of you know. Um, and as was said when Laura introduced me, I just finished spent, finished my six year years on the board of directors of Land Legal, the nation's largest legal organization serving the um, serving LGBTQ plus community and people with living with HIV. And while I am proud of the work we did while I was there and I continue to support them, I can tell you that in every single board meeting I was in, nearly every single committee men meeting I was in over those past six years, I had to confront racism, sexism, some moments of transphobia, especially when it came to trans folks of color, and white supremacy, and micro and macro aggressions. Every single board meeting I had of Land Legal for six years. And while I definitely walked away proud of the accomplishments, I walked away emotionally exhausted and ready to just say, okay, gays, we're going to take a break right now because it is tough, it is hard work, and you, but at the same time, it's important to be at the table and fight. That said, I'm gonna ask again, Leslie, Shannon, Darius, we talked, I'm, I'm gonna borrow Leslie's phrase from yesterday. We're not doing the oppression Olympics here, but it's important to hear from you and how you had confronted the racism, the white supremacy, the, trans, the transphobia, the macro, macro and microaggressions while still trying to serve our community. So I, I, I want to jump in on, on this one because the oppression Olympics is triggering for me. Um, even the term is triggering because there is in fact a difference between a burn on your hand and three fourths of your body being on fire. Um, and I find that when I hear that term, it tends to come from people who say, no, I want to be supportive. But when I hear the real truth, it's overwhelming. So I'm going to do a false equivalency. And then it, it feels like I'm almost saying to you, share, but don't share. I mean, we're not, in the, we're not in the competition. No, I'm telling you the experience. And you don't have the right to say to me, when I say to you the trauma of, of being Black in America or or or, or you know, for my, for my trans brother, add to that. I don't sit with him and go, oh, we're not in the competition. No, I go, oh, I want to hear that. That is intense and that is deep and that is real. So I just want to begin with, and it has been on my spirit since we, we, we use that term this week. I rebuke it. I do not receive it um, because I find that it creates a false equivalency and it is sometimes used as a way of, of audiences saying to me, <laughs> That make, like when I really hear the truth of it. So what happened last year with George Floyd, 
the reason why we're having such a reaction is because we had to sit with it. We didn't walk away from it. We couldn't get on our boats. We were in the middle of the first pandemic. So we all had to sit with it. And that is what happened. What, what I hear when people say to me, oh, this isn't the um, oppression Olympics. You don't want to sit with it or you want to receive it the way you want to receive it versus the way I've experienced it. So, so that I, I'm going to stop and not use more time, but I just wanted to get that off my side. Sure. I appreciate that. And I think it's important. I think, and I'm not going to, and that Leslie can speak for herself, but I think in the context of that conversation, it was yeah. more so oftentimes white supremacist culture will try to divide and conquer us when it comes to getting shit done, getting things done. But I agree with you. I like, I appreciate that. And thank you for saying that Darius. And you're right. This isn't the whose pain is greater. We've all got, I, you know, there's a line from dream girls. F, we all got pain and yes, at the same time, but we must own the fact that there are some, there are definite experiences that are indescribable and that, that no one can, we don't hold up against each other as a comp competition, but I think we've used those experience to, for those of us who have been oppressed and continue to be oppressed to unite and fight. Again, now I'm turning it back over to Shannon and Leslie. Yeah, uh, thank you again for saying that. And I think my piece would be that I do recognize that each of us walk the world very differently depending on which identity is most visible or recognizable. Um, I am a queer Latina cisgender woman, so I do strive to fearlessly show pride in all of my identities. And at the same time, I recognize that some of my identities are perceived more dangerously than others, depending on where I am. Um, you know, working with youth, I know that for many of them, it, it, they have similar experiences. So a lot of our conversations are about empower them and showing their pride while keeping you safe. And <clears throat> I wanna acknowledge that I do have some privileges that come from some of my identities that have allowed me to become invisible in a heteronormative world. Oh, excuse me, my microphone. <laughs> um, when I know that I'm in danger in those spaces. Uh, however, that's not the same for some folks who can't hide their sexual identity at home or who can't change the color of their skin when they're out in public, or and they're often attacked, literally losing their lives and they're in danger. Um, there, are, there is a lot of violence towards trans and black bodies that cost their lives. Um, so a lot of times when I tell my youth, like if it's dangerous for you to scream, I'm here, I'm queer and get used to it at home or in the streets, when we, um, you know, we're trying to tell them be proud of who I am, we have to talk about the safety piece. For some of them, it's not safe to do that. So a lot of our conversations, again, come for who is your chosen family? Who, what are the spaces in your community that can stand by you and protect you and be able to share your identity in a safe space? And sadly, with a lot of our youth, their families are not accepting of their identities. And, you know, this was true for me where sometimes you just gotta hide who you are until you can leave home and it's safe enough for me to explore, okay, now who am I in these spaces? Leslie, um, I, I absolutely um, hear you and, and, and echo that sentiment, right? Because me as a trans woman, as a black trans woman, I'm aware that I have, you know, um, a perception of passing privilege as I navigate the world on a daily basis, which offers me a lot of protection um, in this world. And, and one that I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for. Um, to what Darius said, right? I, I, I do agree with Darius as well. I am so tired of being resilient. And I dream of a day when resilience is no longer something that I get to etch on my resume because I don't find joy or pleasure in coming home and doing this Florida Evans sigh that I've survived another day. You know, it, it's, it's, it's quite exhausting. Um, but, you know, to, to what you said, right? <laughs> um, I think the thing about privilege is this, is that um, number one, it's something that we all do have, right? But we often don't notice privilege because, well, it's, it's, it's what we live in. Um, we have a tendency to obviously notice the things that cause us pain. Um, but 
we rarely realize that we all have identities that confer privilege as well as we all have identities that confer marginalization. Um, but in the end, we do want to work towards a world um, that we want to live in and embrace all of these nuanced identities and experiences and races um, that we have. And I will say that, you know, no, right? Identity is not a way to get out of accountability. You know, um, obviously there are many folks who do weaponize experiences um, for personal gain. And those are things that are equally as destructive. Um, you know, to go back to the original question at hand, I think one of the things that that I find interesting when I do these conversations is that we speak as if um, racism and supremacy and isms and aggressions are some great new conundrum. Um, and when we're posed with these questions, we turn our attention externally as opposed to internally. And um, we are continuously, what we're continuously, I would say, not facing is what we have not done or done through our apathy or through our inertia or through our good intentions. And I'm gonna hover on the words good intentions for a minute because I work with good intention people all the time. I've worked with them for years. They are in my family. They are my neighbors. They are people who I love greatly and owe a debt of gratitude for, right? Your, your allyship, your championship is, has not gone unnoticed. It has not gone on deaf ears. Um, however, there is yet still a disconnect. You know, DEI, diversity and inclusion, bringing someone up through the rankings and leadership is not a checkbox, right? It is a thing that is continuously put into action. And as we said in the pre-discussion, if you are not striving to understand the experiences and the language that your colleagues are speaking in order to bring forth worthy solutions to age old problems, if you are greeting them with what I said was um, more of a bland, charming, cheerful kind of pat on the head, pat on the back, this kind of dismissiveness, um, then you in fact are actually acting out a microaggression. And microaggressions do not just exist in white bodies, people. They do not. They exist in black bodies, in brown bodies. They exist in many different socioeconomic brackets, experiences. Again, um, we have a tendency to forget as we sit in our estuaries of power um, that we hold the ability to encourage someone to move on, move forward with, their, with our actions um, to their next level of greatness, or we have the ability to actually send them back into a space um, that they came from that wasn't so great. Um, so, you know, I just want to kind of leave folks with that. I, I could go on forever about this topic. I know I myself have, um, oh my goodness, have, have felt the sting of many microaggressions um, you know, decoded racism, um, all these other things. And I would like to believe that I handle it as best as I can with, you know, due gentleness and patience, recognizing that we all exist in a supremacist binary cis sexist system. Um, and none of us have escaped the fallout thereof. Um, but however, I do charge you with remembering that while I will be patient with you. It is your responsibility to commit to doing the hard, lifelong work of getting better. Amen. We could end right there, but we're not. We've got more we, more to go. Thank you so much, Shannon, Leslie, and Darius for just um, speaking. It's speaking truth to power. Um, I really appreciate that. I, and, and I know I'm looking at the reactions, and I know our attendees appreciate it as that as well. Um, all of you. Um, have worked at either currently or prior to this moment, worked in the space that is focused on wellness. Um, 
I, so my question to all of you is how do you use your experience and expertise to support people who identify as LGBTQ+, especially LGBTQ plus people of color? Um, so I'll just, that's, that's the question. How are you, how, how yes, tell, tell us about your journeys in that space briefly. Okay, I don't do dead air, so I will no, say no, this. not at all. I just so didn't I want to be the first. This. I want to be the first. first. I'll, no, it's, no, it's okay. No, I'll, that's what the moderator's here for. So I will say this: something that's important to keep in mind too. I'll use what you mentioned, Mark, in the beginning. How we talked about this is we talked about this, this systemic racism, structural racism, things that have been around for forever. Darius mentioned you know, the two pandemics. I don't know if everybody got that T. What he was saying. We talked about COVID nineteen, but also as my pastor, Reverend Dr. Otis Monster III, has said, COVID six. 1619. So that's that's the other pandemic we're talking about. COVID-19, but also 1619. So with that. Yeah, and I actually think there's a third pandemic that we're living through that people are not talking about that's related to the first two. And that is the absolute uh, national and international movement to uh, dismantle uh, democracy. Uh, even a failed democracy that we have here. But I mean, uh, absolute movement to authoritarianism, taking away the right of people to vote, especially people of color, taking away the rights of transgendered uh, men and women, boys and girls indeed, to participate in sports. There is an active, aggressive movement to de-democratize <laughs> and bring us back. And, and, and I think, the, and that to me is, the, the triple threat at the moment. We are living through, COVID didn't expose um, anything that um, we all really actually didn't even know about. It just exposed it to the world. It didn't create these inequities, it exposed them. Um, and we are, and I think, so when I think about the, the mental uh, unwellness of the, of the community writ large, it is like off the charts. Um, and we have an enormous responsibility, not just as a mental health organization, but as all of us combined in every workforce and in every school um, to acknowledge that, that the entire country is traumatized. Uh, it's traumatized by, by these three pandemics. And, um, and it, I think for me, it's about acknowledging the trauma and it is about then standing up and fighting back. Uh, that this is, I think we're at a moment where this is all about action um, and that we have to take every single individual and collective opportunity to act with a fierce sense of urgency. Uh, I, it's unfortunate for me, I'm the most impatient person in the world and it's, uh, and I want this shit done. Oops, this is recorded. I want this stuff done tomorrow. Hey, <laughs> I want this stuff done tomorrow. Uh, so like, how do I balance the need to do this right and to make sure that we have all the all the voices at the table and that, you know, being a good leader means mostly being a good listener. Uh, you know, I think in order to lead, you have to listen deeply, you have to love deeply, you have to laugh. I hope we're going to have time to laugh in the next half hour too, right? right? There's a lot of stuff that you need to do to lead, but, but we have no time. Uh, I mean, okay, so you said no. to be short, that's it. We no, have no time. We, we, we got to be now. brief. What's the, okay. the, the 11th commandment? <laughs> Blessed are the brief, for they shall be invited back. So moving on to the next ones who want to weigh in on this question. <laughs> talking about, I think for, so, talking so about I, Yeah, I think wellness, the first is, um, I think about being in the plane. Um, put your mask on before you can be of support to others. So when the pandemic began, I sat in the chair right behind me and I thought we didn't know if it was gonna be six weeks or six months, but I knew in that moment, I was, I don't know how, but I was gonna come through a change. So I made a commitment in that moment um, that I wanted to be proud of how I comported myself. And more importantly, I wanted to extend grace to myself and others. And what I find, the, one of the things I do to support people in my own untrained and mental health way is to give grace. And, and we talk about safe spaces, but brave safe spaces. I don't think you can have one without them because there is a certain amount of fearlessness that comes with sharing vulnerability and fear. So I find even with my, as a leader with my staff, it is, how are you feeling though? Um, and really listening, active listening, not just saying you can check off a box, but really knowing that your teams and the people around you, we are 
in a constant state of changing at a speed that we have not done it because we are in the middle. And I like it, Mark, three pandemics that resonates for me. So I think the best thing that I can do, one, is take care of me, protect my, I protect my peace at all costs. And if you have the luxury, I have a personal board, Roderick is on, so he has had conversations where he is like, oh, you are feeling some kind of way, but it's a safe, brave space. And I meet with my therapist. Um, so, if, so, so, and I say this again to marginalized community because we are always, so I can speak for my community, no black Jesus. No, I can have Jesus and a good therapist and a personal board of friends and supports. And I think really just saying to people, you have as a part of your agency, you have a right to almost insist on support, almost insist on support for your mental health. And while this is not directly to our conversation, but what Naomi, that young queen did, um, that it, it always comes to this also in this, what are we willing to sacrifice for what we believe? What are we willing to sacrifice for what's important? I know Mark knows this. I was talking about Mark's TEDx. And if you haven't seen his TED talk, find it. Somebody put a link in and send it out to the folks after. But what are you willing to sacrifice? And I say to folks, I'm willing to sacrifice your feelings for my well-being. So no is a full and complete sentence. When I and, and I reach out to my friends and I've been vulnerable with Robert, we have had tears together where I go, this is what I'm feeling and I'm just heartbroken. I don't know why and this is happening. And, and he goes, look, let's talk it out. Let's chop it up. So that's what I would say to folks, fight for your well-being, insist on your well-being. If you have, because everybody does not have the privilege. I, I know I have small, lowercase p. Um, I've not missed a check. My insurance is, is, is in place. I have a job. I, I love two crazy dogs. I know. So mine is to be of service to everybody. I want to just be of service. But first, I got to make sure I stay healthy. So I, I would say if you have those items, take away the stigma for yourself. Get the help. Amen. Get the help and, and lean into your circles. Absolutely. Next, who'd like to jump in? And we're monitoring the time. We're going to go to audience questions in a few moments for our audience who've been submitting questions. Okay, John, go ahead. I saw you. So yeah, um, I'll I'll just uh, wrap this up quickly. So uh, as as we've thought uh, over you know the the last fifteen months of of the pandemic, thought a lot about supporting staff and um, particularly our LGBTQ staff and people of color staff, um, and we did a you know a lot of conversations as as a group and you know large group, small group. We talked a lot about mental health, self care, wellness. But as we think about going back into the world, back to the office, um, how can we sustain that? And how do we make sure we're not going back into the same world that we all didn't necessarily love that much uh, that we had before the pandemic? And I think we've learned so much about um, wellness and supporting each other and as leaders, the um, importance of, of supporting our, our employees so that they can be so strong to support our clients. Uh, so that's something I've been, been thinking a lot about. Thank you, John. And again, we can move on because I don't want to, everybody doesn't have to answer every question. So if we're good, but I want to give space and, you know, and let to Leslie, Shannon, if you'd like to weigh in on this. Okay, cool. Great. Well, we're going to go to the next question that I, um, I have. And then my last question, then we're going to go to the questions we've got from our audience members, right? We appreciate you there. Um, let's just be real about something too, that we have to speak up. Unfortunately, we don't have young voices at this table today, um, but young queer people of color are breaking down. <laughs> Shannon's like, excuse me? Okay. Younger, younger voices at the table today, <laughs> but young queer You're people. You're so much younger than me, Shannon. So I consider you young and Leslie, oh my God. Well, I'm young at heart. Okay, I'm yeah. getting, I'm taking back the microphone. Okay, unfortunately, we don't have young voice, younger voice at the table, but young queer people of color are breaking down barriers and inspiring new conversations and actions daily. So to our panel, and I do want to start with Leslie because you are in this space right now. Um, how are you including young voices in your work? And um, and 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 I'll borrow the words of um, my all of our many of our, our friends and 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 John's colleague Kim Hunt. How, how are we making space for folks who would aren't normally invited to conferences like these and folks who will never be able to afford tickets to our fancy galas, luncheons, panels, whatever. Mm -hmm. but I'll start with Leslie. Yeah. 
Um, I think it, a lot of it is your intention for for all of us. What is your intention on how do we including our young voices in the work that we do? And I've already mentioned this earlier. Um, a lot of it is just listening to them, listening to what it is that they want from you. And um, you know, I'll speak for just from my own experience, trying my best to deliver on what it is that they want. So for the groups that I do run, they're youth, they're youth led. So every week, and by the end of the day, I ask them, what is it that you want to see? What is it that you want to do? What experiences do you want to feel with us? Um, and the other piece that, as you were asking this question, is also acknowledging um, for, uh, for other youth outside of the group that I run is recognizing um, how can I help them? How can I actively advocate for them by li linking them to resources in order to make sure that they are seen? Um, so actually, uh, last night we had a um, Youth Leadership Award. And often, a lot of times in these events, um, I try to push, again, intentionality and pushing my, uh, the Latino folks that I work with to we have these opportunities and say, hey, this, I, I want to nominate you for this, or I want to link you up to resources like this. Um, so I think, again, it goes into intentionality and as well as listening to the young people and providing them to the best of our abilities uh, the resources or meet their needs that they're looking for. Um, I have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Shannon. Um, I will, I was gonna say, I will always and forever be a youth worker. Um, I, I came out of youth work and um, I work with a considerable amount of young people um, in my own personal day-to-day -day life and outside of my own nine to five role. And I'm a bit of a reluctant mother, <laughs> um, you know, whatever that means. Our young people are superheroes and they do remind me that I am aging amidst my waning youth, I suppose. Um, but you ever noticed um, in a movie that when a superhero flies at this supersonic speed that um, the windows of the skyscraper shatter? So I like to tell young people that because you are a superhero, superheroes disrupt systems and things shatter. And that is what I see with this bold, brave new generation who sometimes do things that I lop my head to the side and I try my best to see the value in. But you know what? The generations that came before us did not see value in our movements, but yet and still we now benefit from them. And the generations to come will benefit from their movements. We so often use this phrase, um, pass the torch, but what I have learned is give folks the fire to light their own. And that is what we should be doing. That is the call to action um, that I feel that we should be doing with young folks. It is not for us to understand exactly um, their passions, their causes, their movements. Um, it's for us to kind of do like the Bob Dylan thing and say, you know what, get out the road if you can't lend a hand, you know? Um, give folks, give young people these platforms that they need, um, lift up their voices, let, let them speak and tell us what they need in order to make this world what they need it to be. Because I guess in the words of Maya Angelou, by natural means, I will be gone long, well, well before they do, you know? Um, so it's my responsibility to support them in um, gaining access to what they need to make this world what they need it to be. Thank you, Shannon. Any others want to weigh in before we go to audience questions? And just uh, in, in terms of, um, Shannon, it's such a beautiful quote, giving folks fire to, to light their own. Um, <clears throat> it's a very concrete example, but this summer we are uh, working on a, uh, the, the beginnings of a potential social uh, marketing campaign 
uh, to um, bring PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is an HIV prevention medication, to youth. And so we're, we've brought together um, six teens uh, who are going to be engaged in, it's almost, we're calling it a summer camp almost, um, paying them, them 750 bucks over, over the course of the summer for, I think, five meetings. Um, and getting them at the table while we develop this campaign and ideas for this campaign. And I'm so proud of uh, our, our partner, Elijah McKinnon, and our staff member, Jim Pickett, um, who are bringing together uh, teenagers who are going to be, you know, the, the folks this campaign is trying to reach, uh, and public health researchers and advocates to, to build this campaign. And I'm so proud of the fact that we're paying them for their time and for their work. Great. I, I just want to quickly thank Shannon for throwing a bone to the boomers on the panel and mentioning Bob Dylan. So I uh, I bow to you yet again, Queen Shannon. I love Bob Dylan. So thank you for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's still popular, including with a lot of Generation Zs right now. Um, but in terms of the youth and young adult, I mean, I think if you have young people in any kind of programming, make sure that you have a, a youth advisory board. Uh, which we do, that is critical. Uh, if you are the CEO or the board president and you're listening in and you can have a junior board and associate board at your organization, please consider it. Uh, it's the future pipeline to leadership, uh, especially for young people of color. Um, and if uh, you organize groups at Thresholds, we have Activate Thresholds, uh, which is an advocacy group. We have a cultural humility committee, uh, mostly made up of the youngest people in our organization, uh, really create opportunities. Um, you know, and, and I participate in them. One of the oldest people at the organization is the old white guy, uh, but I participate because it just can't be on the youth and it just can't be on young people of color to be the change that we wanna see. Um, I'm at the table uh, as one of the voices um, to show that I'm an ally and hopefully that I move to comradeship in this. Um, but yes, every opportunity we have, and, and I would say outside of the organization, what I have found really useful, and this might not be considered youth or young to, to some of you, but as a member of the economic club and as a leader in leadership greater Chicago, um, and on the membership committee of the former, really using my power and privilege to identify young people in their 30s uh, and people of color particularly that I have worked really hard the last year to bring onto the economic club. I also helped somebody else on this call get in the economic club, it appears, uh, unknowingly. Um, but, um, but really using the, the power of my privilege and my so-called status, I mean, and I'm just, you know, <clears throat> just a regular working white guy here, but I do have a lot of uh, privilege and and in places like the Economic Club where I can use that to, to bring in the next generation of leaders like Dr. Garth Walker, some of you may know, fabulous young black doctor at the University, uh, from the University of Chicago and now the deputy director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, like the newest right. Economic Club member. So that's right. how we use it. I'll stop. I'm raising there. my hand as moderator now. We, I love y'all. I love all of y'all, but we got to be brief. We got to because we've got ten minutes left. So, does anyone else want to weigh in on this briefly before I start taking our audience? I'm, I'm just simply going to say, um, Mark, I love everything that you just said, um, and I'll tell you something. So often we get so deep into social movements that we forget, like we got to live in this world, right? Like um, financial literacy, upward mobility. Um, you know, just just knowing how to actually just navigate day to day life um, to be able to um, maintain your stability. Those are really important things. Right. I mean, black folks specifically, I'm thinking of have been deprived of generational wealth. And I see people who for the first time are making more than a living wage, like are making dollar amounts. It's like, my God, I never thought I would make this. But you go, well, yeah, you like wear it all on your back. Like, I mean, and, and I'm not knocking anybody, but we all, God's will in the creek don't rise, we'll get old. Um, and we need to know about investment planning, 401ks, 403bs, whatever all those things are. We need to know those things. Um, so thank you so much, Mark, for that type of commitment 
because we need that desperately in our community. So please continue to do that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's not just the, it's the, the hard skills, the soft skills, the, the things just to basically keep you living through the rest of your journey. I'm going to, so thank you for our first question. We're going to take is from Kate Finner Lux. And um, I think all the panelists will see the question as well. So for, again, the ground rules for this one are, if you care to weigh in, weigh in. When you weigh in, be, make it brief. In censuring these voices, and to John's point about the board, how do you address the power structure and funding by government and donors? That that drives most of the nonprofit agencies and social change support through funding. I hope I said that right, Kate. There was a couple of questions, but but that's the that's the question from Kate. Does anyone want to jump in on that? I'll start this off. Thank you for that great question. I think you know we're we're struggling with this right now um, at AIDS Foundation because there's there's one grant we we get that um, we haven't had an increase. Um, in that funding since 2004. Um, so Mark, that was when you know you were CEO at AIDS Foundation, um, uh, and that's you know that that's driving um, our salaries for our lowest paid staff. It's driving you know so much in our organizational structure, and this is why advocacy work is so important. It's why um, uh, we have to center policy and advocacy in our work and. Uh, if we want to build strong organizations um, and particularly strong Black and Latinx-led organizations that are, you know, centering LGBTQ um, uh, people and leaders who are amazing at serving the population, um, the funding structures that we have right now from government and sometimes foundations just don't work. Uh, and so advocacy. Got it. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, go, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, okay. I got to say I really quickly that when the rates uh, are so low from state and federal um, funding entities and, and, um, and the rules and the regulations by these agencies stymie the work that we do, white-led, black-led, brown-led organizations, small nonprofits, big nonprofits, to me, that is structural racism. When the rates and reimbursement are so low, when the folks that are working in these organizations, and especially um, in the in the human service organizations, are mostly people of color and young people of color. And to Shannon's point, how do you build wealth and how do you build capital capital if the reimbursements from these state and federal programs are so low that you can't pay staff barely living wages to save money, to make money, to buy apartments, to create wealth? But I do have to give a shout out because part of that question was asking what foundations are doing. And I think the local foundations in Chicago are making Herculean strides in transforming their philanthropy, right? right. Uh, Angelique Power from- uh, Field uh, Foundation. From the Field Foundation, absolutely. Michelle Morales at the Woods Fund. Yes. Uh, Helene Gale, the queen of the scene at the Chicago Community Trust, yes. investing their millions, if not billions of dollars in building wealth in black and brown communities. So it's happening in Chicago and we should praise those leaders, especially Absolutely. women of color who are leading the way. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So shout outs to definitely to Helene, to Angelique, to Michelle, to others. Um, and I definitely want to give a shout out to folks. We have the, the black, the black and brown led and run organizations like Affinity Community Services, like Brave Space Alliance, like Chicago Black Gay Men's Caucus, like Vita Zeta for the work that you're doing as well. Next question comes from Stephanie Beckler. Um, her question is: Some of us work for organizations that have created considerable space for conversations on racial justice, but have shown discomfort in taking on intersectional conversations on Black LGBTQ and justice. What advice do you have to help us lead these conversations and propose internal changes in our organizations? Thank you, Stephanie. I'll give that to whomever wants to weigh in. Um, I'd like to jump in um, and, and I like to give respect where due. Hello, Dr. Bechtler. Um, and, and I, you are in the space. I know the work that you do. I, I think we're at the point now, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. What are we willing to sacrifice? Um, and when do we get to the point of this is our last best chance? So we have to, those of us who are in these spaces, we have to insist on it and we have to keep asking for it and keep asking for it and keep going, but let's then maybe, let me try a different approach with you. 
Let's talk about the why this is important. Maybe if we can agree on why, we can move it. But I think part of my our shared accountabilities as leaders, and, and, and Dr. Beckler, you, do, you have done amazing work with your organization. I think it really is saying, here is why this conversation is important. I'm going to bring all of the equity I have to bear for the work I've done with this organization and insist with respect that we have this conversation. Um, so, so I think that's all we can do. We can lean in the space and, 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 and at some point be able to walk in the room with a resolve where people go, he, she, or they are serious. At the very least, they have enough equity. They've built enough equity. They're coming in here and they're speaking clearly and removing emotion, um, but keeping passion. I think that's all we can do, but we have to make it uncomfortable for them to say no. Um, and, and, and I say to people, I'm going to force you to say no to my face, look me in my eyes, and I'm going to keep making you say no until you say yes. Thank you, Darius. Any others to weigh in? Leslie, John, Mark. Leslie, go right ahead. Yeah, um, I think um, a lot of times when do, at least in what I've seen at UCAN, um, the people who are in the front lines, asked to have these conversations. How are we talking about the injustices that we're seeing in our own city? And a lot of times, I think there is a disconnect between upper management and the folks that are in the trenches. So um, I think uh, I think this is a hard one because it's a work in progress in my own organization. How are we making change? And it is uncomfortable as someone that is in the trenches being able to say, we need to have this conversation. Um, I mean, all I can really say is that I know a lot of the leaders are willing to listen and to hold those spaces, but at the same time, continue to be able to say, we need ongoing. I think it's just an ongoing conversation that we need to have these conversations because they are important and they are going to make us uncomfortable and being okay with that discomfort and being okay that um, sometimes some people are going to get defensive. And for those people, or uh, that has happened to me too, where I feel, well, I will get defensive. And when I notice that that happens with me, it's like, okay, let's just sit back and listen mm -hmm. and, and really take it in and explore what it is that I'm saying. And if I have to relearn or rewire something a way that I'm thinking to do that for myself. So I will hold myself accountable. And I think if I'm able to model that for, you know, my coworkers or whatever space that I'm in uh, for them to hopefully be able to like take, have that as a takeaway during, um, during these conversations. Absolutely, thank you. I'm going to go to the third question um, from third and final audience question from someone many of us know, uh, my buddy Yusef Garcia from Forefront. So you, Yusef's comments, thank you all. What I am hearing is a commitment to transfer power to affect change. What are some examples of pushback that you as leaders in positions of power experience as you continue to challenge others? e.g. C-suite, board, stakeholders, et cetera, as you continue to transfer power, which is very threatening to white supremacy, patriarchy, and antiquated hierarchy. He wrote a book, but that's the question. Yusef, we love you. So um, <laughs> our friends, um, please weigh in. Well, hey, Yusuf, nice to not see you, but to see your name and hear you. Uh, it's sort of a, it's not a direct answer, but it's sort of related and it's something that I talked about with Darius and others the other day. Um, after the, the George Chauvin trial, which resulted um, in, um, in the result that we all know, um, I, uh, I sent an email to our entire uh, not just the staff, of course, which I did, but to the entire community of, of Threshold supporters, including our donor database that goes back 60 years, <laughs> uh, talking about the importance of this verdict uh, as justice for George Floyd and accountability, uh, really, for police brutality. Um, because I think it was an important um, message to send uh, about how important this was to our staff, to our clients, to the community, uh, and to um, changing power dynamics. Um, and 
I got pushback. I got the equivalent of hate mail. <laughs> I got donors that said we're done uh, with thresholds. And I, uh, and I had a, took a deep breath and I was really sort of scared for about six seconds um, and then thought, okay, um, I did the right thing. Um, so I think your question was about pushback and that's just sort of one institutional example of pushback. Uh, but I have to say the response overwhelmingly was positive. And even from people who were uncomfortable, they appreciated actually being made uncomfortable uh, and having to confront their discomfort. Um, so, you know, I, I think our responsibility again as leaders is to speak the truth, to stand up, to show up, uh, to say words and then to act out what white supremacy means. I mean, you have to say the words white supremacy. We have to say the words white privilege. Um, and um, it's, um, we can't expect people of color and other marginalized communities to only take those words and speak them. Those are, that it is about us and, um, and we have to speak truth to power as well. Mark, that was that was so beautifully said, and um, and uh, Yusuf, I, I think we we need to have a drink to unpack this question. Maybe <laughs> a, a lot of drinks to unpack this question. Um, Yusuf is is one of its foundation's amazing board members. Uh, I, I think an, an example I want to give is um, you know we we had a board member say well in a board meeting actually, um, but something like but black people can't raise money; they're not good fundraisers, um, and. Uh, on one hand, it was great to have that out in the open so we could address it and um, to bring amazing Black and Latinx people who are great fundraisers onto the board um, and who are willing to do that and to learn. Um, so uh, I think I think that's one example. Okay. Okay, friends, we've got to wrap it. Thank you, John, that triggered me. I remember when we asked um, the then head of legal at Lambda Legal, John Davison, God bless you, Don, if you're watching, you're going to hear about this, this whatever, about where the black lawyers were. It was their hard to find. And I remember a member of the board who's based in Atlanta, whose name I can't remember right now, which is lucky for him. Um, he proposed, maybe we should just have a diversity board if there's an issue about black people of color on the board, because which was racist and white supremacist and made the assumption that we can't raise money, that we are only good for checking boxes. Those are things that I heard directly in meetings, live and in living color, no pun intended. So with that being said, um, I'm gonna, before I turn it over to um, our to um, my, our great colleagues at um, UCAN to close us out, I wanna, of course, thank every one of you on the panel. Shannon had to leave early. She had, she's on a, board, a, a staff retreat at her, <coughs> Howard Brown. But uh, I will leave us with this one final word from um, one of my heroes, Bayard Rustin. Let us be enraged by, about injustice, but let us not be destroyed by it. I'll say it one more time. Let us be enraged about injustice, but let us not be destroyed by it. So with that, thank you to our dear panel. Thank you to you, our dear attendees. Thank you to you, Can. And now I'd like to turn it over. This has been great. And thanks for having me back. And I'll turn it over to Bianca Cotton, uh, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator at UCAN to close us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I just want to sit with that for 10 seconds. Wow. Uh, I have a notebook full of notes. Thank you, Roderick, for moderating this amazing panel, very reflective and thoughtful. Thank you, Leslie, John, Shannon, Mark, and Darius for sharing your heart, your thoughts, your wisdom, your knowledge. It is a pleasure closing out this amazing, um, deeply reflective conversation. Again, I'm Bianca Cotton, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator here at UCAN. Daria shared with us, go where love is being served. I love that. Mark uh, talks about having a youth advisory board, uh, looking forward to not being silent. Leslie, share so much um, listening with intention to our young people, uh, asking them what they want, how do they want to feel. Uh, Shannon came with the power and the fire, um, survival of sustainable 
and stability in her life. Um, get the infrastructure for DEI. John, getting young people to the table and paying them. Roderick, it's important to be at the table to fight. So we thank you all for tuning in, for listening, for being with us, for sitting with us. Uh, take this conversation back to your circles and your communities and the recording will be shared uh, post this event with everyone um, for the intersectionality of race in the LGBTQ community. And if you are a UCAN staff, join us for our Pride Alliance meetings that happen every third Friday of the month. So you can reach out to me if you want to join or Michelle Grimes, our chair. Until next time, until we have another DEI event, be well, stay safe, and keep fighting.